Welcome to life unrestricted. This is your show if you're sick of living a life controlled by food and exercise rules and if you're ready to learn how to accept yourself and enjoy the heck out of life. My gig is about body image, femininity, self-worth and resilience. Come on, let's walk side by side as we slowly step out of restriction misery and unlock our true selves. Your host, Merit Boxler, is a former national radio DJ, freelance journalist, speaker, and writer with a passion to make women feel good in their bodies. This is a show brought to you live from Switzerland. Well, hello, lovely radicals. Merit here with episode 8 of the Life Unrestricted podcast. Today I get to talk to Vanya Fetidis from Sussex, Great Britain. Vanya is an intuitive eating counselor, an MBE teacher, MBE being the acronym for Mindfulness Based Eating Awareness Training, as well as a self esteem mentor. She has a Master in Education for Sustainability from London South Bank and a Bachelor degree in Psychology and Art History from WITS. She is 48 years old and she's living with her husband, two children and a dog in, as I said, Sussex, the UK. For me, it's vulnerability time today, Ta-da! because in this episode, Vanya doesn't just show us how we can let go of our food and weight fears and approach health from a sane and loving perspective, but she uses me as an example and questions my inner gremlin voice on one particular issue. Find out how that turns out. And as her name betrays, she is Greek, but as she informed me, she is also British and South African, so she calls herself an international citizen. I wasn't sure whether I pronounced her name right when I called her Vanya Fetidis, and then she was surprised when I called her that. And then I had to ask her, well, how do other people call you? Oh, Vania, Vanya, uh, Vania, uh, and then Fatidis is Fatides, <laughs> Fatudis. So funny. I remember when I was growing up, one of my, uh, my brother said to me, um, just tell people it's like fat eat this. Fat eat this, fatidus, fat eat this. And I just I've thought just thought about that right now and I thought, isn't that interesting? Not nice, I would say. <laughs> I don't it, think it was with any judgment. I think it was just something, but although, you know, conversations about diet and fat and weight and all of that were very endemic in our family. So yeah. not not surprising. Yeah. So please, in order for us to get to know you a little better, take us back into your story and tell us what made you who you are today. Well, um, I grew up uh, in a family of um, mum and dad and four, three siblings. So four of us um, all together, two girls and two boys. And um, I, I remember really from very early on my sister's eight years older than me so I remember from really early on um, my mom and my sister going on diets and you know they'd have the chart up in the bathroom where there's the bathroom scale and the chart was you know where they are now and where they want to be in you know six weeks or two months or whatever with the weight you know and you kind of draw the line going down because that's your sort of ideal direction of travel and yeah. so there'd be a chart on the bathroom wall and um, and then, you know, they'd stand on the scale in the morning and tick off. Or maybe it was just my sister doing that. I don't remember if my mother did that exactly the same as my sister did. But, um, you know, and then you'd see, the, you'd see the reality compared to the, you know, the imagined scenario or the desired scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and but probably around the age of eight, I would guess when my sister was 16, I got it into my head that um, I needed to do the same. And, you know, when I've thought back over time, you know, what, what was that all about? What happened? I think really it was partly copying, copying my mom and my sister. But I think more deeply than that, you know, they were the two women in my life I looked up to and revered. Both 
you know, externally validated as beautiful women. Um, and to my young mind, I think, you know, I would have thought if they are not good enough as they are, then how could I possibly be good enough as I am? Of course you would have thought that, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I started to copy them. And they'd be going on diets. And I would kind of secretly, without them knowing, I would just follow along. And I remember giving away food in my school lunchbox or, or, or just throwing it away and not eating it. Um, and by the time I was about, when I went to secondary school, I was about 13, I had to have a, a palate widening appliance put into my mouth that was fixed because I had a lisp and I had a narrow um, roof of my mouth. And so the orthodontist wanted to widen it. And so every night I had this little key and I had to stick it in and wind it to open it. Ouch. Mm. Well, it wasn't painful, but I could hear it kind of cracking every now and again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what happened was it got infected. And that, that was pretty disgusting. Um, and I couldn't eat. And so I lost a lot of weight. It got very infected. I got really ill. And um, it actually made a hole in the roof of my mouth. So oh. it was both painful, but also an infection. And I lost a lot of weight in a very short period of time. And I started to get all this external validation about, mm. oh, you've lost so much weight. Oh, you, you know, you've got really thin. And, um, and I got it. I kind of liked that feeling mm. of having control over food, you know, that I didn't have to eat was like I was in charge of my biology you know mm -hmm. which of course I wasn't but for a short period of time one can do that and um, and so from then on I started to even the even when I got better I started to do these crazy fasts that my mother was just none the wiser to she didn't know um, but I would go all day without eating I would pretend that I'd eaten I would just drink water for like two weeks to oh, three weeks God. at the age of 14, 13, 14, 15. Mm. And, um, and then I would go on these wild binges with my sister. And um, we would, you know, we'd go to the shops and we'd, she was, had a driver's license by then. So, you know, we kind of were free. We'd go to the shops and we'd stock up on all sorts of stuff. And we would just sit there and eat, you know, slices of white bread and butter and honey and whatever else we could get our hands on. Yes, yes. And, um, and so, you know, I went on this, I started yo-yoing. And then, you know, we would try and be good and we'd go on diets and it was very much a thing we would do together. And then um, one day we were in, um, we were on holiday in Greece as a family and my sister, I don't know how I, I learned, but anyway, I basically I learned that she was throwing up to keep her weight down. And I was like, oh, gee, that's a good idea. I mean, I, I didn't know there was such a thing as bulimia. Yeah? Never heard of it before. Yeah. I didn't know the word. No one knew, yeah. No. I mean, this was in the uh, early 80s. And, um, and I thought, gee, that's clever. Um, you can actually eat whatever you want without it mattering. So, the um, big dream. Yeah, the big dream. So then I became bulimic. And, um, you know, I, would, I engaged in the same kind of behavior for two years until I became so down, so depressed, so kind of hopeless. So it, it kind of, it, it has a life of its own. You can really lose yourself in that swirl of binging and purging. It's like nothing else exists around you. So did it get worse and worse? Did it get worse and worse? Yes, I mean, it did. It was, it was, it was you know, once a week or twice a week, and then it became one, three times a week, and then it was every day, and then sometimes it was even multiple times a day. Mm. It never got to the point where it was everything I was eating or, you know, every meal or whatever. But, I mean, I even remember, I mean, this... This isn't something I've shared, actually, particularly readily with people. But I remember even being in restaurants, you know, and going into the restaurant toilet. You know how disgusting that is? Yeah. That is really, really pretty grim. Growing up in the restaurant toilet. I mean, really, what real um, desperation. 
And how much you felt isolated and different from everybody else and ashamed. So ashamed, really yeah. so, so ashamed. It was very, very hard. And anyway, it got to a point where I just said to my mom, I need to go see a psychologist. Said, I, I just need to go see somebody. And so she arranged with somebody that I, you know, we had somebody coming around to do school visits who is a psychologist. And I, it was the only person I knew who was a psychologist. So I said, make me an appointment with that person. <laughs> So she did um, and didn't ask me any questions, but took me. And But I couldn't get the words out. I didn't know how to say what was going on. I didn't know how to speak. I didn't know how to express. I, didn't, I couldn't say the words. And so I would just sit there week after week saying nothing. And then eventually after about, I don't know, five sessions or something, he said, look, this is wasting your time, your parents' money, my time you know, I'm going to have to call this to a close unless you tell me why you're here. And so I just took a big breath and I just said, I just can't say it. And I can't remember how exactly, but I, we kind of got into a question and answer game where, you mm -hmm. know, I kind of was trying to get him to ask me the right question so yes. that I could just say yes. <laughs> and not have to actually say the words. And so, so he did eventually. And then he said, I have to call your mother in. You're underage. This is a life-threatening condition. And it's my duty. So that very session, he called my mother in. I tell you, my, heart, my palms are sweaty right now thinking about it. Um, and I felt like my whole world was going to fall out, fall down and, you know, fall through me. My whole world was just going to collapse. The thought of my parents knowing And um, he called my mother in. I couldn't make eye contact with her. Anyway, he told her and um, I said, I'll stop. I will stop. Please don't tell dad. Just don't tell dad because the thought of my dad knowing and, you know, being concerned. But I suppose mostly I've feared him being disappointed. Not that he was ever a super critical father who was, you know, lauded it about or anything like that at all. But... You know, I really respected both my parents, but, you know, I really didn't. My mom already knew. I didn't want my dad to know. Um, so it wasn't so much about being exposed, but rather you didn't want to be a disappointment for him. Yeah, I didn't want to be exposed as a disappointment. Not that I was ever taught that I was a disappointment, quite the opposite. But still, that was my, you know, I was so ashamed. Um, so I stopped cold turkey. Ooh. I just stopped overnight. Uh, but then what I did was go on diets. So I stopped the bulimia, stopped the bulimic behaviors, the purging behaviors, but that didn't change my mental health. That didn't change my relationship with food. That didn't change my relationship with my body. That didn't change um, how I viewed myself or, or any kind of solution. And I stopped going to see the psychologist. So I didn't get any help, but I went on diets because I thought sugar is the problem. You know, this food is the problem, dairy is the problem, wheat is the problem, you know, and so I started doing all these elimination things and, you know, I'd gone these long, I became a vegan, a vegetarian, I was an exercise maniac, you know, I would yes. you know, go hitting the gym at 5.30 in the morning and before I'd eaten anything, of course, and, you know, all of that kind of thing. Um, and so I yo-yoed and for the next 20 years... I, I was on diets, basically, you know, but in the guise of getting healthy, in the guise of, you know, becoming clean, um, you know, detoxifying, I'd call it mm -hmm. all sorts of things. Yeah, nowadays, people don't want to admit they're on diets. So they just call it their new lifestyle, exactly. whatever that yeah, it's just yeah. the same thing. It's restriction. It's restriction. Yeah. So and what happened after that? So how did you come out of dieting? Well, how I, you, what's interesting to me is that what I did not know was that diets don't work. They didn't work for me, but I thought I was going about them wrong. It was exactly. me. Exactly. It was me. It was mm. that I didn't have the willpower or I didn't have enough control of my mind or whatever. Exactly. I had no idea that diets don't work. Well, what happened was um, a friend of mine uh, who lives in South Africa, we, we went to school together, and she's also similar to me. In fact, she's now working as a coach doing the same thing as me. And um, 
she called me up one day. I'd just been on a diet and I'd come off this radical diet where I'd lost my period and, you know, Mm -hmm. and I was binging like nobody's business. I mean, I just couldn't get enough sweets and sugar into me. It was like, you know. And, and she you called, felt like a failure probably all the oh, time, please. right? Yeah. But you know what was so funny? Not funny. I mean, as I look back, it's sad because ooh, I would expect to start a diet knowing I would get to my target weight and be there for a split second. And then I would go up again. I mean, a split second in evolutionary time. I mean, literally a week, two weeks or whatever. And then within months, I was back up where I was before or more, yeah. higher weight. So anyway, I sh- this friend of mine Skyped me and she said, I'm so desperate. I have to go on a diet. What have you been on? And I said to her, please don't. I don't know why I said this to her. Wow. But I just said to her, don't. Don't do it to yourself. This is just miserable. It's not a way to live. This is terrible. Don't do it to yourself. Don't go on a diet. And she was kind of blown away, but she heard me. And she went off researching and exploring. And about six, I don't know, a few months later, I don't remember when, she called me up and she said, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for telling me that. And she said, go and get this book. It was a book by Martha Beck called The Four Day Win. I, it's not my go-to book, by the way, but it's the book that opened my eyes to understanding the biology of what happens that your, your, your brain goes into famine mode and your body, you know, we are wired for feast and famine. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, there was not food all the time. What Martha Beck says is she's got your dictator, that's part of your brain that is just saying, you have to lose weight, you should do this, mm-hmm. you've got to stop this now and pull yourself together and enough of that, and no more sugar and, you know, whatever else. And then on the other side of it, you've got your wild child, she calls it. He just says, I'm not doing this, you know. I'm eating all the things. No, I'm eating it. Don't tell me what to do. So part of it is biological and part of it's psychological. Why don't you explain the diet mechanism a bit better for people who are not familiar with the fact that diets really don't work? Mm. Well, what happens is... You go on a diet and so you're restricting yourself. You're restricting either types of food or amounts of food, you know, calorie intake. So when your your body goes into a a deprivation mode, okay, you're you're reducing your calorie intake in a a rather radical way. Your body goes into this kind of sense of deprivation. So your metabolism actually slows down. Your cortisol levels increase. It's a stress response for your body. Your body goes into a stress mode. Now, what cortisol does is it it tells your body to slow down your metabolism because, hey, chaps, we're in a famine. We have to hang on to everything here. Slow down the metabolism because I don't know when we're next going to eat or when we're going to next get enough food. That's what's going on in your brain. The other thing that cortisol does is it actually signals your body to store fat. Anything that you're then eating isn't getting properly metabolized. It's getting stored because you're in famine. Exactly. And we put exercise on top of that. More stress. Exactly. We we do more exercise. uh, You know, we, we, we push ourselves because we believe, you know, calories in, calories out. You know, what you're burning compared to what you're taking in. And so we add more cortisol because that kind of exercise, which is not particularly pleasurable, will Mm -hmm. still elevate your cortisol. So you've got Mm -hmm. a double whammy around your cortisol levels. All of this is hugely stressful. Then there's the psychological deprivation, which is I can't. I'm not allowed. These are sins. Good food, bad food. Good food, bad food. I've been good. I was bad. Exactly. I've been good. I've been bad. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not allowed, I can't have this, um, it's, or I can only have this amount of that. You know, all that kind of restrictive diet talk, call yeah. it diet police. That's what we hear all day, all around us. So it's, I understand why we would, you know, copy these thoughts and make them our own. Exactly. Yeah. It's everywhere. It's everywhere you're reading. It's in our news feeds. It's in our newspapers. Mm-hmm. It's on the radio. It's, it's just everywhere. 
So, um, and so you've got both the biological compulsion to eat because you do need to feed yourself. That you are not to blame for. You're not to blame for it. And then you've got the psychological deprivation that your wild child or your inner rebel will just stick up one finger to, you know. So even if you're not restricting your calories, you will still have the psychological deprivation. If the diet mentality is still active. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, exactly that. So anyway, this was like I had new life. <laughs> It's like I woke up to, you know, the world is a different place. Diets don't work. It's so simple. But weren't you afraid because you knew that, oh, all the yo-yo dieting and you're going to gain everything back and probably more? That's the fear that keeps people stuck in dieting, I would suppose. It is. It is. You see, what people don't realize is that the cycle of dieting includes the binge and the weight gain afterwards. People don't see that as part of the dieting cycle. They see dieting only as the part where you lose weight. Yes, exactly. And then the rest is your fault. But actually, it's all part of the same cycle. So, but I think once I'd understood that, yes, of course there was fear. You know, of course there was fear that, um, that I would put on weight, that if I really gave myself permission to eat what I wanted without conditions, without tomorrow's, you know, I'll, and to, to be honest, to begin with, it wasn't unconditional. You know, I had cold feet. I was scared. I didn't want to. I was, I was one of those people who fears obesity. Now I'm one of the people who's advocating <laughs> radical body acceptance. But, but, but in my journey, obviously, I had, to, I had to get to the point where I am now. And at the time, I was fearful of, of becoming obese. Yeah, I am now in the process only of, you know, tackling the issue of internalized fat phobia. I didn't have a name for that. So yeah. I think it sums it up pretty nicely because that's what, what has kept me stuck all the time. And I think we really have to work on that in order to ever be successful at healing ourselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. So See, I mean, it comes down to acceptance. How did you do that work? It takes time. This is what I always say to my clients. It's, it's a practice. But what did that process look like for you? Well, there's several things. I think, I think engaging in body positivity um, mm -hmm. is, is hugely important. I mean, to be honest, when I was 20... Uh, 25, probably 26, um, I read The Beauty Myth. And that was a hugely impactful book for me, hugely impactful, because I, I began to see the whole culture of beauty, what it was doing to us and what it was, you know, what it was encouraging, which was basically women um, becoming over-involved in, 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 in a small thing, which was disempowering them from playing big in the world and making a contribution that they really want to make. Because they were eternally distracted by the idea that they have to be and stay and yeah, become exactly. skinny. And it takes a lot of energy. Yes, it does. It takes masses of energy to be focused on your parents, you know, and not mm -hmm. just your hair and your makeup, but, you know, you're staying thin and, and, and looking toned and not having cellulite and being tanned and, you know, all the long mm -hmm. list of, of requirements for women. I mean, there was just in the news uh, a few days ago, there was a woman who stood up to her company because she was told she had to wear high heels. Oh. She had to as part of her job. She ha and she challenged it and she won. But this is It's 2016. Ridiculous. Oh, my God. Now, yes. I read The Beauty Myth. 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. This is a long time that this has been going on. So what I'm saying was, even though I read The Beauty Myth such a long time ago and it had such an impact on me, it didn't, I did not get out of that uh, quest for thinness, that pursuit of being thin for a, for, a, for a long time after I read The Beauty Myth. But also we're talking about in the sort of late 80s, so around there. 
So there wasn't a lot around. There wasn't Facebook. There wasn't social media. There wasn't the internet. And so now there's a fantastic opportunity. We can curate what we see. We, you know, somebody was asking about that the other day, you know, and, and they were saying, well, you know, we're in the real world. Somebody said we're in the real world and we kind of need to deal with what's in the real world. And I said, yes, that's true. And we've got enough in the actual real world to deal with. But our social media is something we can curate. We do not need to follow um, Fitzbo, things that, you know, promote um, dieting culture in any way even though it's wrapped up in health. And of course, I am absolutely for health, you know. To be, I'm, I consider myself healthy and I want to be healthy, but there's health and then there's the extreme fixation. The obsession with... Obsession, yeah. exactly. And so we can choose what we see on our social media and mo anybody who's probably listening to your podcast is on social media. So I think that that is a really important thing that we can do now, which is to fill up our space with things that promote body acceptance and a healthy attitude to food and bodies and women and empowerment and self-advocacy. And just to say, I mean, doing that was the first step for me and it feels good. So I would strongly recommend um, to everyone to purge their social media feeds and make them body positive because it feels good and we're actually going strong in the right direction mm -hmm. so there's only that's a win-win for everyone and that's the first step and mm -hmm. it's an easy one the thing is you see that that it it's there's so much in here the, all of this is around what our brains do okay our brains are central to this whole thing and what we're needing to do is retrain our brains. So what helps retraining our brains is repetition. So the more you repeat something, okay, so most of, many of us have repeated hundreds of thousands of times certain beliefs about ourselves that are not true, but we believe them to be true because either we were told them or we've, we've sort of imbibed them from the culture. So they seemed true. So they seem true because we're believing them to be true, mm -hmm. you know, and they're being reinforced by what's around us. So if we fill up our social media news feeds with things that keep on reinforcing that kind of thinking, it's just going to keep on reinforcing those neural pathways. So if we do something different, we're going to be, in re we're going to be creating and reinforcing different neural pathways. And it's really, really important that we start to think differently and practice on purpose different thinking around food and our bodies and ourselves. Give us an example. Okay, so, and this, I, I've just got to say, I'm not really into positive thinking. <laughs> no, me either. <laughs> you cannot fool your I subconscious. I don't believe in positive yeah. thinking. I believe in truth-telling. You know, telling mm -hmm. the truth. Mm -hmm. So it's not true that I have to be thin to be acceptable. That's a lie. So the truth is that my acceptability has got nothing to do with my body size. And then in the beginning, you don't believe yourself. That's the problem. You go like, yeah. But right. the thing is, you know, because you can say to yourself, okay, um, so and so who I know in my life, uh, they have a large body. I'm not even going to use, I hate the word overweight, because what does it even mean? Mm. But that's another conversation. But, you know, they've got a large body. Uh, is that person worthy? That of person's course. worthy. Does, is that person lovable? Totally. I love that person to bits. Exactly. Does that person have something to offer the world? Yes. Why would it be different with me? You, you kind of need to find ways of reminding yourself that it applies to you as well. And sometimes it can feel a bit fake and sometimes it takes quite a bit of, you know, uh, effort to, um, you're not trying to convince yourself of something because you think it'll be good for you. What you're trying to do is get, you're trying to repattern your thinking. You already know that it's true. And the difficulty is knowing that it's true about you. 
exactly. So recognizing that it's true about other people and then saying, well, that must be so for me too because why is it true for that person and that person and that person and that person? Why is it different for me? What's so special case about me? And that's where the body positive community online really helps a lot because we see so many badass women out there who rock their bodies in every size or every shape. And that's, you know, that's reinforcing the new belief like, wow, she's great. And, you know, you wouldn't judge her. Exactly. Um, you got into intuitive eating. So mm -hmm. you talk about full permission to eat. For some people, that sounds strange because their argument would be like, wow, I would never stop eating and you are promoting obesity, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. So how do you explain that to someone who is not familiar with intuitive eating, how it works? Okay, great. It's a great question. What I would say is that when you really give yourself unconditional permission to eat with no ifs or buts, no shoulds, no tomorrows, no, you know, whens, untils, etc. You learn that that food is available whenever you want it. You learn whether you actually like it or not. Because when there's not permissiveness, when there's not real permission, then, you know, what you are, if you think about a teenager and you say to them, you're not allowed to, you know, stay out until midnight, they're going to stay out until midnight. Sure. You know, <laughs> yeah. not, well, my parents, you're not allowed to take the car out. When I was 14, I took yeah. the car out. You know, I mean, you, you will yeah. rebel against the things you tell yourself you can't do. So if you really do, Give yourself permission. For a while, it's, it is scary. Take, I suppose, take the trust from those of us who've been through this process and who, you know, whom we help get through this process, that um, it is a process. And yes, it's scary. But learning something new and letting go of the old is scary. Um, but when you do give yourself that permission you learn that it's available when you next want it. And it takes away that kind of forbidden um, desire, the desire for the forbidden. And I've, I've seen it just over and over again, clients of mine saying to me, I can't believe the ice cream is still in the freezer. It's just like, I don't really want it. Sounds incredible, yeah. <laughs> Can different people, depending on who you are, what you've come from, you know, all of that, and I can't even put, I couldn't put a time scale to it even. For some people, it takes longer than others. But, and every now and again, when the, when the fear creeps in and that need to control creeps in, it takes longer. It gets in the way of the peace process happening. Mm -hmm. But that's also just part of the learning. So for a while there, we have to step into uncertainty, I guess, because I remember... Um, it was years ago, um, even before I was at my worst, actually, I had uh, discovered Janine Roth and her books. Mm -hmm. It was way before Women, Food and God came out. And um, she describes this phase where all she eats is, I don't know, chocolate fudge cake or whatever it was. Chocolate it was. chip cookies, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, something oh, <laughs> grand like that. And that that just as you said, that eventually this desire faded out and that she found her own intuitive, you know, healthy, quote unquote, approach to eating mm -hmm. and that she had to go through that and just that was actually there and that it was okay. But I didn't believe her. I still mm -hmm. find it hard to believe it, like, mm -hmm. because I've been doing this for so long, mm -hmm. not intuitively eating, that I truly think I would just spend the rest of my days with my face in Nutella jars, you see? Mm -hmm. So, but that's probably what everybody is saying. It, I think so. And it, it's a leap of faith. You kind of need to, uh, you need to get to a point where you're willing to take that leap of faith because the other way you, you get that that other way doesn't work either. You know, the dieting, yo-yo dieting or the restriction or whatever it is, is not making you happy. It's not serving your life. And you've been doing it, trying the same old thing for years and decades for some people. That yeah. was certainly so for me. 
And so at some point, you, I, you, you hopefully get into a community like, you know, the Facebook pages that we run mm -hmm. or, you know, other places, the actual, you know, in-person groups or whatever, um, where you, because of the community and because of all of these people doing the same thing and sharing their experiences and it, it doesn't feel so scary or so alone because you can see other people are doing it too and you learn about their stories. And the more I think people read about and learn other people's stories about doing this, the more uh, courage maybe they can take and the more they might be willing to step into their own uncertainty around it. You know, it's, it's kind of knowing that other people have walked on the hot coals, you know, and, and you could do it too without burning your feet. Yeah, exactly. I think we can't do it without support. I certainly probably couldn't do it. Um, but I hear the health concern troll comedy raising the health flag, like, mm. wait, 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 you can't mm. do that. This is not healthy. Mm. And I um, invite you to explain them otherwise well actually weight cycling is very damaging for health this period of unconditional permission to eat it's not like all day long although for Ginny and Roth and for some people they might eat you know cupcakes every day for two weeks that's mm -hmm. what they might do but actually that um, going through that and getting to the other side of it for however long it takes for you to do it On the other side of it is moderation, is learning how to eat according to your hunger and your fullness, is tuning into your body and seeing what you actually want to eat. Because binging isn't necessary anymore, because your body trusts you not to starve it anymore. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Your body trusts you that it will be fed Your body also trusts you that cupcakes are there anytime you want them. And your mind trusts you. It's not just your body, it's your mind as well. But coming back to the health misconceptions, in our society it seems totally ingrained in everyone's brain um, to mistake health for thinness or mm. vice versa, which I know personally from myself that it's very much not true. It's also a very dangerous misconception and you are one that passionately dispels those myths mm. that say that healthy equals thin or quote-unquote normal-sized. Mm. Um, for most people, sadly, um, this is not true or they cannot wrap their head around the fact that this could be true. What do you tell them? Mm. Mm. Well, studies show that, you know, quote unquote, overweight people actually live longer than normal people. That comes from, you know, Linda Bacon, who I'm, I know you're familiar with, health at every size. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, no studies have ever shown that weight loss prolongs life. Really. Weight is a correlation With, with most health problems rather than a causation. Exactly. It could be a symptom of something, some dysfunction going on, some metabolic problem in, in your system. Or But not. It's, it's not. Or not. You know, every overweight person is not unhealthy and every thin person is not healthy. I exactly. mean, that is absolutely true. And also that blends into something else that I found very upsetting, um, that it is people seem to nowadays feel entitled to comment on every other person's body, which, I mean, probably you and I and everybody has experienced. I have experienced it when I was bigger, as in people telling me that I looked fat and I was not attractive enough or blah, blah. But I've also experienced it in the years of torturing myself. Then the compliments came. Wow, you've lost weight, just mm -hmm. as in your case. Mm -hmm. As if I had achieved something great, like inventing the solution to our <laughs> yeah. environmental the problem. Collider. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't do anything great. So how mm. do you deal with that when you find yourself in a group of people where inevitably, it seems, diet talk, body shaming or weight loss talk starts to happen? Um, judgments are judgments. 
you know, whether they are quote unquote positive or negative, judgments are judgments. And, you know, I, I try to steer away from judgments, whether they are positive or negative, actually. I don't think that they're particularly helpful. I now, I just tell people straight um, what, what, uh, what I believe, what my journey has been, what dieting or what focusing on quote unquote healthy eating and all of that, what that did to me and um, what my journey has been and what I, and also what I do for a living, you know, what I see in, in the work that I do and, you know, people who come to me, if people are interested enough, but, but often it depends on the situation. If it's a kind of cocktail-y situation, I'll just move on to a different conversation. You know, I'm, there needs to be an open door for a conversation to happen. And I'm, I'm not going to stand on a soapbox and lecture to people. Yeah. If, if, there's, if there's an opening for something, like somebody is struggling or suffering or fed up, or if they're talking about, oh, I can't because I'm on a diet again, or, you know, I can't have that, or I'm being bad, or something like that, that would indicate maybe there's a little bit of an opening for a conversation about it. I, I would kind of have to gauge it, you know, around whether I felt that actually saying something would be of any benefit because if there isn't an open door to something then you know what's the point I'd rather go and talk to somebody else about something else I usually say something um, but it happened to me a lot that I just it seems to be lost on people what I say because it seems to be that you know the the act of berating ourselves is nowadays or maybe for a long time it's been seen as the normal behavior and yeah. sometimes it's even being mistaken for motivation to improve ourselves quote unquote yeah. uh -huh. and I do not judge others for judging because I still do that often I find <laughs> myself unaware and then my gremlin voice starts mm. yelling at me or throws shoots at me like mad so sometimes I just listen to that voice and out of fear I obediently follow those shoulds and shouldn'ts but I have come to learn that that usually doesn't get me very far in mm -hmm. terms of self-acceptance and confidence mm -hmm. and it is a pretty much well-known fact that punishment and negative self-talk will only make us feel deflated and desolate, which will keep us going back to diets and trying everything to get outside approval. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't really ever work long term. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how do you teach people to uh, create new habits from a different standpoint, from a place mm -hmm. of acceptance? It's not a switch that you can just turn on. Sadly, no. Right. Today I'm accepting myself, mm. you know. It's a practice. And what's required is knowing what you're telling yourself. And that is a skill you can learn, how to become more aware of what you're telling yourself. And one of the things that I teach is mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And one of the benefits of, of mindfulness is... It helps you to slow down. It helps you to slow down what you're thinking so that you become aware of what you're thinking, so that you become aware of how you're feeling. So if you're in one of those environments where, you know, I remember one of my clients, she went to a seminar or something, and she said all the, the women were in a little group and they were saying, oh, no, we shouldn't have a cookie. We shouldn't have a biscuit. Oh, but we're being bad. Or, oh, no, tomorrow I won't. Or, you know, whatever. And she noticed this whole conversation, because she'd been learning about how to know what she was thinking and how to recognize her feelings through the practice of mindfulness, she was aware of how she was feeling in that situation. She became aware of her body. She became aware that she was feeling stressed. She became aware of some of the thoughts that she was, that were going on in her mind. She became aware that she was agreeing with these women and she became aware of the pull into the, the cultural, the way of wanting to be accepted. So if I'm also talking about my body and the cookies and having them or not having them and being good or whatever, then I'm in the club. 
And she became aware of all of this in the moment. So it was because she was practicing the mindfulness and because she was doing the work around her mind and she was learning about all of that, that in that moment she recognized what was going on. She was, what we call in mindfulness, she was being able to be her own witness as to what was going on and as to her role that she was playing out in this group of people. So the practice of mindfulness, and what I say to people is they say, oh, but I can't stop my mind and I can't stop the thoughts. That's not what mindfulness is about. It's about becoming aware that you're having the thoughts. It's about becoming aware that you are feeling whatever feelings you're feeling. That practice rewires your brain. For me, it um, has become a very, very, very useful skill to create space between my racing thoughts mm. that are telling me to go back to obsessing and whatever mm. so for people who are not familiar with them how do you teach them well um i teach the meditation so you know every session i do starts with a meditation um and you know instead of talking them through the process of it and helping people develop as they go through if you know i, I if i hear what the experience is and i'll suggest something that can help um, in their practice, but the thing is to practice it. So it's about, so really what mindfulness is, is it's about setting aside some time where you turn off everything. You're not even having music. You set your clock for however long and you focus your attention on your breath. So you're becoming aware of your you know, where your breath is coming in at the tip of your nose, going down the back of your throat, into your, into your abdomen. You notice your rising and falling of your chest and your, and your belly. And then the exhale, you notice the, the air flowing out again and warmer coming out through the tip of your nose or if it's coming out of your mouth. You're just noticing your experience. There's no way it should be. Whatever your experience is, that's what you're noticing. Then you notice your, your mind starts having thoughts about, oh, I forgot to, you know, put something on the shopping list or, you know, have I closed the door or whatever. You notice what is starting to distract you. If it's your mind, you might notice a car going by or, you know, whatever. And so then you notice that's a car or you notice that's a thought and you bring your attention back to your breath. Without judgment without judgment. You know, it's not like, oh, geez, there goes my brain again. I'm there. I am with a million thoughts again. <laughs> or even if you notice you're judging yourself, then you notice that was a judgment. It's okay. You know, it's just mm -hmm. like we can accept that there's a judgment, you know. And so it's, it's training yourself in that period of time to both become aware of your, your experience And then you are training yourself to bring your attention back to your breath. And training where you put your attention in this world is priceless because we live in an ADD world. Mm, we do. <laughs> we really do. And learning where to put your attention and how to train your attention is so, so, so important, not just for our lives in our, you know, in our relationship with food, in our lives, in our relationships with people. But how does this help us to be strong enough to, you know, talk back to the inner gremlin voice? Because recognizing it is one thing. Mindfulness has a different approach, which is, um, which is actually even accepting those th that inner gremlin because it's a part of you it's not something to fight against i prefer to kind of make space for that gremlin i don't have to it's just like a tantruming child you know because that is what the brain is it's just a bunch of thoughts that you've thought over so many times that's all it is and a bit like a tantruming child it's just screaming and jumping up and down and having its thing The worst thing to do is to engage with a tantruming child. It just fuels the fire. Yeah. <laughs> they scream even louder and they get insistent. So getting into an argument with your gremlin and <clears throat> telling it why it's wrong is just setting up more struggle. 
and that, you know, I'm just for peace, not for struggle. So you let it say its thing? For, let it say its thing. That could go on for half an hour in my it case. Could. It could. And actually what I do when I'm working with clients is I, 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 I scribe what their inner gremlin is saying. And then we have sometimes two or three pages of mm -hmm. inner gremlin talk. And then we look at each one of those pieces Ooh. with kindness. I and see we... tears coming up already if I only <laughs> think about it. Like, that must hurt. Yeah, we look mm -hmm. at each one with kindness and with compassion. Yeah. You know, it's like, and just, is it true? You know, is it true? Um, how do you know it's true? You know, sort of, so look at the in, inner gremlin, you know, and, and sometimes there are pages of what the in, inner gremlin is telling you. It's not something we have to fight Although it requires effort to meet it and to challenge it, but not challenge it in a way that is a struggle. Challenge it in a way that is telling the truth. How could that look like in a real example? Well, um, give me an example of, of one of your in a gremlin okay. thoughts. I'm trying to take a rest day and um, I know that I will eat just as much as I normally would because I love eating so mm -hmm. that gremlin voice tells me to get a move on you need to exercise today no rest days for you mm -hmm. and you will only let yourself go and you're going to be a lazy and you're never going to move a finger again and mm -hmm. it's it's the same with you every day i have to you know push you so that you actually move your behind <laughs> you mm -hmm. know what i mean so it's it doesn't stop mm -hmm. until i get mm -hmm. moving and mm -hmm. obey it or i get i get really anxious that would be a case Yeah. So a lot of shoulds and have tos. Yes, or else's. Or else's, exactly. So I have to move myself, I have to get out there, have or to else make I'm up lazy. For something, I yeah. have to earn something, and mm -hmm. this and that. Yeah. Or else I'm lazy. Mm -hmm. or, or else, what else? What are the other or else's? Yeah, that's the internalized fat phobia again. Like you're going to blow up. Like there's yeah. no tomorrow. You're never yeah. gonna. You're never gonna move again. You're you're gonna die with your face mm. in a jar of Nutella, mm. which is a nice picture, by the way. But no, yeah, you, <laughs> you get what I mean. I get what you mean. Mm. So then, so then we, we we look at all of those things, and I say to you, well, is it true that if you don't exercise today, it means that you're lazy? Is that true? I cannot disprove it. Mm, but is it actually true, really, that if you don't exercise today, it means that you are lazy? You, Merit, are a lazy person. No. No. No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that. It might mean you're having a day off exercising. And in fact, is having a day off a healthy thing to do? Mm, yes. <laughs> Yes. Is pushing your body on and on and on healthy for you? That's what society tells us we should do. That's why I've, I've bought that forever. Like, yeah, But is it true? I would, I would really say challenge that, that, that even though we're being bombarded by things about exercise, really any exercise guru worth any weight at all will say take rest days i mean you know any app that you'd be using to for any exercise would say okay you know rest day or do this three days a week or you know whatever mm -hmm. so i think that it's we've internalized yeah i have to i have to i have to or else and i think the thing to, to challenge is the or else thing the most because the or else is is kind of how you summon yourself up as a person mm -hmm. or else i'm lazy Or else, you know, I'm worthless. That's the fear deep down. Yeah. Whoa, what if I am a lazy person, you know, disguised as an active person? Mm -hmm. What if I'm a fake skinny person and, and, you know, all that? The gremlin is very articulate. Mm, it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah, I guess it comes at me from all different angles. You know, when I gained a lot of weight back, 
after my worst days, uh, it started coming at me for gaining the weight. Mm. And then when I, you know, didn't uh, further reduce my exercise, which I probably should because I have not gotten my period back, um, then it says, um, yeah, you're only a fake skinny person anyway, because I'm still straight sized, you know, so uh, you'd right. probably be a, a slob if I let you. Mm. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So therefore, you are a fake skinny person because you are staying thin um, out of um, will rather than something that is just the size you are eating in a normal way. Yeah, that's what I think 90% of, of the women um, we know are doing, actually. They're weight suppressing. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the old myth about you, mm -hmm. um, there's a, th a thin person in everyone or mm. what else it was that opera said mm. um, that I thought, yes, well, oh gosh, yeah, yes. what if it's the other way around? And most mm -hmm. of us are actually weight suppressing or trying mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean by skin. Uh, fake skinny like I'm still trying hard to maintain this because I'm afraid mm. to be shamed because mm. that's mm. what is happening out there that's why I think we really have to change the paradigm and make mm. that that fat shaming and that mm. ostracizing of people with bigger bodies stop mm. Mm. because it it holds all of us back and it hurts um people in bigger bodies a lot and it doesn't help anyone no it doesn't but to get back to the thinking the thought mm -hmm. about you know a fake skinny person it's a judgment isn't it yes it is it's a judgment and are judgments actually true about somebody or is it just an opinion and a it's it's something leveled at somebody else it's a is sarcastically it? hissed remark Mm. from the gremlin yeah so what you could do is look at what actually is true what's true is i'm i'm in a thin body i haven't got my period back i'm scared i'm scared of what restoration might end up looking like mm -hmm. i'm scared of being rejected i'm scared of being rejected that is true that sort of goes to a different level when you know what your thinking is, you can make a choice about whether you're going to keep believing it or not. Yes. So um, I used to believe, and sometimes I still dip into this kind of thinking, also that I'm a fraud. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm a fraud. I'm a fake, whatever. You know, I'm not so-and-so, these other people who are doing this brilliant work that, yeah. you know, who've got all the, the – appear to have <laughs> – it all together. It all together and, you know, doing these brilliant courses and, you know, whatever, whatever. And, you know, get into mm -hmm. this sort of comparison thing. Yeah. Um, I can choose to get into that and compare myself and not move forward with the people that I can help with in the way that I can with the skills and the heart. That I can choose to... Um, not move forward because I'm basically believing I'm a fraud, which is the same thing you're telling yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm a fake skinny person, also known as I'm a fraud. Yeah. Yeah. Or I can, I can say to myself, actually, I am me, <laughs> you know, and look at you, Merit, doing what you're doing, putting yourself out, creating this podcast, inviting people, being so vulnerable being so honest about where you are and, and, and who you are, does that look like a fraud to you? No, not so no? much. And does this look like a fake skinny person to you? No. I don't know. Let's talk in, in a year. <laughs> then we'll see. I'll, I'll probably say, see, I was skinnier back then, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, of but course. It, but anyway, it's saying... I need to think more about the fake skinny one because there's, there's just so much in there that really needs to be unpicked, mm -hmm. I think. And it's also, you know, the judgment and the shaming, as you said, and it's the sentence that lets me know how much internalized fat phobia there still is mm -hmm. in me. Mm -hmm. And that's a goal mm -hmm. for me and for the world as well. Mm -hmm. Like that's, 
I'm passionate about making this work. I'm passionate about, um, you know, one day being able to tell you, I don't even care what kind of fake size I am. I just mm -hmm. am. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't pass judgments like this to mm -hmm. myself anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, for now, I'm just exposing the thought mm -hmm. that is still there, mm -hmm. that whatever I do, it's not good enough. Mm -hmm. When I'm skinny, I'm fake skinny. When mm -hmm. I gain weight, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm already too big, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. So mm -hmm. that's, that's where I'm at, like mm -hmm. exposing exactly. the gremlin voice. Yeah, exactly. And so then you bring kindness and compassion to that gremlin voice, which you recognized as internalized fat phobia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why am I so negative about myself still mm -hmm. when I'm so positive about everybody else? I mean, I'm being really vulnerable now, but um, I want to grow. I don't want to get stuck here because then I can't be of much help. You know? Exactly, exactly. And that's exactly the same for me. You know, it's like, well, I get scared too. You know, I get scared about, you know, finishing my course and putting it out there. And I think, oh, my gosh, you know, mm -hmm. it'll I'll be rejected. People won't like it. You know, it'll be mm -hmm. crap. Yeah. Um, you know, there'll be all of those things. But, you know, as Brene Brown says, and she's, you know, this place is full of failures. You know, we've all had to go through um, our put ourselves out. And really, why is because it matters. Exactly. If I can just help a few people to um, free themselves, I'll step through whatever I need to step through. A hundred percent, only a hundred percent. And that's what I learned when I was studying with her. Like, oh, what do you mean? You all have the thought that you're a fraud? Mm. And then I even heard um, Oprah say once mm. um, that, you know, these gremlin voices are in all of us that keep telling us who do you think you are or you're not enough. So mm -hmm. it was good to see that we all have the feeling that sometimes, you know, the imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. um, that we can do it nonetheless and that mm -hmm. we can grow nonetheless. And mm -hmm. my biggest motivation is to to see, just as you said, if I only touch one person that needs to hear this, I'm good. Mm -hmm. So, if that so, if it's so, is it worth you battling your fake skinny stuff? Oh yeah! <laughs> in order to help, you know, one other person battle their fake skinny stuff. Of course it is. Yeah, I know that, and I see that, and that makes me feel good as well, and it connects me to all sorts of great people like you as well, mm -hmm. and have such great conversations, which is incredible. So I have. <laughs> You know, the, I have to thank my gremlin, in fact, if you want to look at it that you way. You know what? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I just, I say I am grateful, really. I'm grateful that I was bulimic, that I, you know, went through what I went through because mm -hmm. it's taught me so much about myself and it's helped me be able to help other people. And, it you know, that's worth something. Yeah, it is. It's I heard somewhere, I don't know, I wish it were I wish it was my quote, but it isn't. Um someone said, um it might just be that your own mess, your own hot mess is someone else's miracle. Making the best of the struggles that we all went through. Yeah. And that makes you know, that gives my life a lot of sense and that makes mm. me feel better in what I do and what I think. So before um, before I ask you my final question, I'd like you to let everyone know uh, where they can connect to you, where they can find you. Would you let us know your contact details? Yeah, thanks. Um, I am online. I'm at peacefuleating.co.uk. That's my website where I have a, a free mini ebook that really tells you, I think, pretty much what about what I needed to know in order to free myself from um, dieting hell. Um, and I'm on Facebook. I have a page, Peaceful Eating. And I have a group on Facebook called It's Not About the Weight. I'm on Twitter, a Peaceful Eating. So basically, Peaceful Eating is, is where I'm at. Yeah, I'm going to link to your page and your website uh, in my show notes. 
Uh, you can find that over at lifeunrestricted.org um, in the podcast section or lifeunrestricted.org slash L U O O eight. That's Life Unrestricted Episode Eight. So my final question for you, Vanya, mm. um, would be: What would you like to be remembered for? Hmm. What would I like to be remembered for? Wow, this is like Desert Island Discs. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I would like to be remembered as a certain kind of person, hopefully. Um, you know, somebody who's approachable and understanding and kind and compassionate. And really as somebody who has advocated for women to be free um, of body image worries, of restriction in any way, really as somebody who is an empowerer of women and men, actually. I do have, I do work with men as well, but it's definitely mostly women. Um, being tripped up by body image and food worries does not empower us to live our biggest lives. So I suppose that's what I would like to be remembered as, somebody who empowers people to live their biggest lives in the way that they want to. You couldn't have said that any more beautiful. I like it. <laughs> thank you. It was a really good conversation. I want to thank you for your time and for all of what you said. Thank you so much for inviting me, Merit. It was really fun. This was today's dose of badassery from Life Unrestricted. Find the show notes with links to everything we mentioned in this episode over at lifeunrestricted.org. And if this show is making you feel good, awesome, make sure to subscribe and please let others feel good too. By leaving a five-star review on iTunes, you'll help make this show more visible and therefore more accessible for others. You're the best. Thanks. Thanks.